Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have with me again a uh, good co-host, Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff, thanks again. Good afternoon, Brock. How's it going? Pretty good. We have today a actually highly requested topic. It took us a little while to get them on, but um, surely they are here. We have with us um, Andreas from Luster, um, the parallel file system. So, Andreas, welcome to the show, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, um, I'm Andreas Dilger. I have been working on Luster for about seven years now. It's basically um, since the beginning, and um, I've been previously involved with uh, with EXT3, and I'm one of the EXT4 maintainers still, and um, been doing file system development for a large part of my career. I guess I guess the other thing to mention, I work for uh, Sun Microsystems, and uh, I'm currently one of the the architects of Luster. Okay, so could you give us a quick summary for someone on um, what Luster is and what its target audience is? So Luster is um, a distributed file system that's used quite a lot in uh, high-performance computing. Um, it's essentially uh, a client, a clustered client-server file system that allows um, the, the storage capacity and the performance of a single file system to be scaled by adding uh, additional server nodes and um, it um, the main the main driver for luster is is really scale and uh, we run on usually seven of the top ten um, systems in the world and you know, really, the target audience is people that can't meet their their file system needs. You know, with a single you know large file system server, right? So if you can do what you want with you know a big NFS filer or a big you know NFS server from EMC or somebody like that, you know that's probably a good solution. And then Luster takes off from there when you need you know two or ten or a hundred times the bandwidth and capacity that you can get from, you know, one physical server. You mentioned uh, EMC, like NFS appliances. Luster, is it an appliance? Does it have hardware and you buy the hardware and the software is all integrated? Or is it just software that you run on top of white box hardware? Or, um, uh, what, it's, what? It's, a, it's a little bit of both. Um, I mean, Luster itself is is just software like NFS, right? It's it's largely, um, you know, protocol and implementation. Um, it's not standardized like NFS, but, um, you know, we, we run Luster on a wide variety of hardware and uh, it can use basically any backend disk storage that appears to Linux as a, you know, a block device. So it can be hardware RAID, it can be software RAID, um, you know, fiber channel, SCSI, SATA, disks, whatever. Um, and the, the, so, you know, the software that, that we, um, you know, we don't really sell software, it's all open source, but we make Luster available, um, you know, to whoever wants to use it. And then, um, depending on, on your requirements, people use it as, um, you know, an open source product, and they install it themselves and manage it themselves on white box hardware. Uh, you can get it through resellers, you know, HP and Cray and Dell and um, you know DDN, a number of different partners that that take Luster and then they um, you know configure it and test it on their hardware, and then they provide you know first level support. And um, some of the some of the vendors um, are looking more towards appliance, right? HP, in particular, they sell um, they call it SFS, which is their scalable file store. They essentially sell Luster appliances, and um, 
you know, most of the other vendors, they sell it as part of a, a complete package that includes, you know, Cray, includes Luster on their XT3, XT4, XT5 systems as the base file system. Okay. So it spreads the whole range. You mentioned, um, you know, Luster targets scale. Uh, that gets a little confusing sometimes in disk systems. You talk in large files, large total file system size, high um, bandwidth, high IOPS for a large number of small files running around. What, what does target? Does Luster actually hit all of those? Um, it it actually does. I mean, it well for most cases, it doesn't necessarily um, do the best in the case of large numbers of small files because that isn't really the the market that has been you know driving the development of luster um, we definitely target uh, large total you know high total throughput um, large numbers of large files um, you know the 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 bigger the file system in general the more likely it is to be using luster uh, once once you get into you know, small files and high counts of small files. The, the the current implementation of the Luster protocol isn't really optimized for that because we we do a lot of of work to uh, optimize the I/O requests for large I/Os and to get the maximum bandwidth. So that's sort of one of the weaker areas of Luster is, is small files, but you know, people still use it in a, a general environment, you know, use it for home directories and things where the files aren't necessarily huge. So, Andreas, how did Luster actually get started? What's some of the history? Um, so, actually, before I started working on Luster, um, back in 1999, uh, we started doing a project for Seagate that was related to object-based disk storage. And at that time, the intent was... Um, more along the lines of replacing, you know, SATA or fiber channel, essentially, well, I think that was probably even before fiber channel existed, it was essentially replacing SATA and SCSI with uh, Ethernet, and you'd have object-based disks, and the file system layer would just talk to, uh, you know, inodes on the disk, and it would handle all of the allocation internally. And... Um, so at the time, you know, we worked out a prototype that was based on ext2, you know, sort of split in half with with the inode, you know, sort of block storage layer underneath and, you know, a, a file system level on top. But um, that project actually got cancelled and um, so there wasn't really in interest in, you know, developing a whole new, you know, interconnect, you know, protocol at that time and... Uh, so it, it sort of sat on the shelf for a few years, and then Peter Brom, who I who was you know the head of that project, you know he was uh, you know tossing this idea around for a while, and you know took it from being a single um, you know a single disk kind of file system to being uh, you know an aggregate of these object based disks, and so it went from you know, a small scale one PC kind of system to um, the this the level of handling high performance file system I/O, and at the time there was a project um, called the ASCII Path Forward that uh, was looking for next generation, you know, storage solutions for their their upcoming supercomputers, and um, Peter Brom got a contract developing. Um, the this the file system for this this um, ASCII path forward contract, and so we were partnered with Intel and Hewlett Packard to take essentially this prototype, you know, object based file system, and you know, increase it so that it's a client server file system. You know, it has cache coherent locking. You know, it can scale I/O as you know as linearly as possible as you add devices into it. 
and from that point um, you know we we stopped working on individual disks and because we have to implement the lesser protocol and software you know you essentially have a PC now that's sitting in front of the disks and in order to um, I guess mitigate the costs of having this PC implementing the protocol we start having big RAID arrays um, behind it so instead of having individual object based disks now we have essentially object based servers and so that was that was really the beginning of, of Lustre um, we, we, we started on this this it was actually a five year contract to you know implement prototypes and progress the design through various um, stages of development and um, you know one of our our early development partners was uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and um, they actually they they weren't doing any of the development per se but they helped us a great deal in providing um, systems for testing and uh, actually a really good development environment because even on their largest clusters they have you know serial consoles and crash dump and everything like that so that you know once you have um, you know encounter a problem with your system you can actually debug it in a reasonable manner right without having kernel crash dumps you know the the development of an in kernel file system especially a network file system is significantly um, you know hindered and because of the scale at which we need to test um, you know this isn't really something that that any individual can do at home on a reasonable scale right you really need the, the large systems in order to catch race conditions and loading and things like that so our you know our test cluster was essentially a, a thousand node um, system at Lawrence Livermore that you know we ran on for quite a few months before we could get a, a reasonably stable and usable uh, file system so being a network guy, you said the magic uh, N-word in there, and, and um, I just have to ask, what kind of networks does Lustre support? What do you what do you run on, and what transports do you use? So Lustre actually um, is different than a lot of um, other network file systems in that uh, instead of just using TCP networking for the, the, the transport and then, you know, building everything on top of an IP network, Lustre actually um, implements its own networking stack called LNet now, and um, it it works. It does work on on top of uh, TCP, but Lustre also uses um, native InfiniBand using the the OFED stack. Um, in the past, before uh, OFED existed as a standard, we used to support um, you know all of the different vendor. InfiniBand stacks from Cisco and um, all of the you know four or five different InfiniBand stacks. We also support um, the Cray internal networking um, called CSTAR and uh, MirrorNet and a bunch of different high performance, low latency um, networks used in supercomputers. And so, really, one of the the um, the reasons that Luster can can scale as good as it can and get as good a performance as it can is is due to the you know the implementation of the networking protocol that we have and in that regard we're very fortunate to have you know a top notch um, you know experienced network um, initially a networking developer but now we have a networking team that can really you know squeak the last bits out of each protocol that we sit on top of and Lustre um, uses RDMA on basically all of the networking types except for TCP which doesn't support RDMA but that really makes the, the uh, protocol much more efficient over the network so let me ask you then, I mean, so you mentioned one thing already, RDMA and I assume also heavily influenced there is the uh, you know offload the hardware um, as opposed to being driven by software. But what, what other kind of tricks do you do to, to get the high performance? I mean, you mentioned that you're optimizing for max bandwidth. Um, you know, what, what kind of things do you have to do um, in order to give these kind of guarantees? 
Um, well, for, for, for TCP, for instance, one of the tricks that we do is um, the, the inter-node connection um, at the TCP level actually uses three different sockets, right? We have a, a, a one socket that's for low latency, small message passing, and you know the the TCP options are tuned appropriately for that. Um, then we also have a, a set, one socket for large message sends and one socket for large message receives, and so that allows us to. Uh, tune each of those connections independently. Um, you know, things like Nagel are um, really bad for, for low latency messages because it, del it deliberately adds delay into a message in order to try and aggregate them together. But, um, you know, that hurts your protocol. If you can only send, you know, 100 or 200 messages per second, right, you're not going to get any better performance than that. And, uh, you know, we do similar things on the higher performance um, network interconnects, you know, they, they also have a concept for sending small messages very efficiently without RDMA, and then the larger messages require RDMA, so we try and, um, you know, pack the, the Lustre protocol messages into, you know, the smaller request size, and then only when, when the message size, you know, if it's a large request that it might have a 4K path name or something, it might need to set up a little RDMA message. But generally, we try and keep the, you know, you know, util utilize the most efficient um, messaging type for each each protocol that we support. So you have these different things floating around. Um, can you give a little bit of overview about what an MDS is, an MGS is, and what an OSS is? and which one is responsible for what type of performance and what one can you have multiples of? Okay, so there's, um, there's three types of servers, those, the, the names that you mentioned. Those are each different server types. Um, an MGS is the management server, and um, it handles um, configuration of Lustre clients and servers. And, uh, you know, it holds um, essentially files with individual configuration records in it. And when a client first mounts, um, you know, you give it the MGS name and a file system name, and then it will connect to the, to the MGS and pull the configuration log, you know, which servers are part of the file system and various configuration parameters, you know, the maximum RPC size or you know, maximum cache size or whatever tunables there are for the file system. It gets that from the MGS. Um, the, uh, the second one, the MDS is the metadata server, and uh, it's responsible for um, handling all of the, the path name lookups and uh, permissions and quotas and things like that that, um, you know, essentially what most people consider as part of a file system. Um, you know, you, you do your directory listings and things like that. That's all ha handled on the, the MDS. And now on, on a single MDS, which is, you know, the name of the server node, there can be multiple um, MDTs. Those are metadata targets. And so those are essentially um, individual file systems that are exported from a metadata server. And in the current um, production versions of Luster, uh, a metadata server can have multiple metadata targets that it exports, but each of those targets is for has to be for a separate file system, right? So if you're, you know, if you have, a, you know, let's say a file system that's Scratch and a file system that's Home, you can serve both of those off of a single metadata server, but uh, in the current releases you can't have uh, you can't scale up essentially your metadata performance by adding multiple metadata targets into a single file system uh, the third type of server that Lustre has is an object storage server that's the OSS and again it's a server node that exports um, essentially the file data for all of the files in the file system and each OSS node can have one or more 
OSTs, which are object storage targets. And those are the individual file systems that, you know, store the objects that hold the file data. And unlike an MDS and MDTs, you can, you can add essentially, well, as many as practical OSSs and OSTs to a single file system. And that's how you scale your capacity and you scale your bandwidth for Lustre. And so, you know, typical numbers would be, you know, at least, you know, four or more OSTs just because of, you know, scale. You don't necessarily want to use Lustre for the tiniest systems, but it goes up as high as, you know, 1400 or so is the largest production system today that has 1400 OSTs on about 200 uh, OSS nodes and um, you know when once you get that many servers going the clients they connect directly to the to each of the object storage servers and they can pull their data directly from each of the servers without involving you know the, the metadata server for instance and so that allows you to scale your bandwidth um, directly as you add more um, OSSs and OSTs to the file system. Uh, adding more OSSs and OSTs actually does other things too because you're adding network ports if that's a bottleneck, you're adding CPU if that's a bottleneck, you're adding the Linux disk cache, you know, more memory on every one of these servers floating around. So unlike an appliance where you just keep adding on shelves but you're still limited on however many network ports or how much performance the head has, with Lustre, you just keep tacking on servers and you you add that performance for all those pieces on through. Yeah, by all means. Um, you know, that's one of the, the, the good things about Lustre is one of the fundamental design goals is that each of the, the, the OSTs in the file system are completely independent. They don't um, communicate with each other. They don't need to coordinate anything. And um, so... You know, like you said, you add in a new OSS node, you get, you know, as many, um, you know, network channels as you want. We try to design systems when we're the ones doing the, the system integration for Luster. We try and design, you know, the OSS nodes so that their network bandwidth, you know, is roughly balanced with the I.O. bandwidth of the backend disk storage. And generally, you know, it, it, we try to target that we'll, we get about 95% of the raw disk bandwidth and 95% of the raw network bandwidth um, when we're, you know, setting up systems. And, you know, like also you can add in RAM, right? The larger, um, the larger the RAM is, you can cache more metadata. And in the 1.8 release of Lustre, you can start doing read caching on the on the server, and that's an interesting little tidbit that in days gone by the kernel was actually slowing down the uh, performance of the file system by putting data into cache, and uh, while it you know it works fine on your desktop or something like that, if you consider that some of the larger Lustre file systems have you know, 10,000 or 20,000 clients connected, you know, you can blow through gigabytes of RAM in just a few seconds. And so it's not, um, it's not practical to cache data and reuse it because it just disappears so quickly. So until very recently, it was actually slowing down the file system IO to even put the data into cache. And just with the, uh, you know, improvements in the newer kernels and the fact that cores, you know, CPUs are a lot faster, we started, you know, reintroducing the ability to cache data on the server. So in the 1.8 release, you can you can do read caching of data. So actually, this leads uh, straight into a question that I wanted to ask. Was, it was, you know, about the whole uh, multi-core uh, crisis or multi-core phenomenon or multi-core boon, depending on who you're talking to here. You know, how does that, how does the fact, uh, you know, affect you, uh, a file system, you know, particularly since Intel has finally made the plunge and gone NUMA and things like that. So, you know, how do these um, types of architectures really play into, you know, how you design your algorithms for max bandwidth and max, 
you know, quickest response and things like that. The fact that you effectively have multiple layers of RAM and you might have big RAM, you might have, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM effectively for caching, but you just talked about how, you know, sometimes that's not a good thing, but sometimes that probably is a good thing. And how do you tell the difference? And, you know, how do you, how do you handle all this kind of stuff? Well, so the, the, the good news is that, um, you know, Lustre has been running on high-end um, systems for quite a long time. So NUMA and, you know, multi-core um, systems have been, you know, pretty much the regular hardware that Lustre runs on. And so especially on the server side, which is, you know, highly multi-threaded, it, it works, you know, pretty well. Um, we do have NUMA support for some of the allocations and things like that to try and keep them local to the threads that are running. Uh, and the threads are, you know, the service threads are bound to particular cores so that they keep their cache locally. Um, you know, on the client side, it's quite a bit harder. Uh, as, as we get to multiple cores on the client, um, basically I think everybody agrees that the, the individual cores are not going to get any faster and in fact they may start getting relatively slower and so that that is a problem for certain types of workloads because you know if you have a copy and it's running only one thread you know your sort of bandwidth limited in terms of how fast can you copy data from user space into the kernel that's actually a significant um, problem these days that as you get up to you know a gigabyte a second or two gigabytes a second, you know you're you're totally saturating one CPU just to do the the memory copies from user space to kernel space, and so um, you know in some workloads where you're doing one thread per core, it's it's not a problem, and that's pretty typical for HPC. But we are <clears throat> we are discussing internally um, some ways to. Uh, multi-thread, you know, memory copies from user space, even if you only have a single a single process, you know, doing a system write call. It just, there's a certain upper limit on how much you can help before you start getting other problems due to locking and things like that. And so if you have big, you know, multi-megabyte write calls, you can still multi-thread that and, you know, chunk it up into smaller pieces that get copied in parallel but it's not going to work for every kind of workload um, we are still working on improving the uh, the you know locking and things the SMP locking as as the number of cores increase um, you know in recent testing we found that as you get beyond about 16 cores you start to um, taper taper off your performance and then past you know 32 cores the locking contention gets too high in certain parts of the luster io stack and so that's something that that we're working on now so that by the time those those systems become more common um hopefully we'll have it addressed so come back up a little bit you mentioned that um the largest production system had um, over a thousand OSTs across 200 OSSs. Can you give us an idea of? I guess there's a couple of different measures of largest here. What's the largest size file system? What's the largest bandwidth per second file system out there? They they're both the same one. Okay. Um, it's it's publicly known. They made a press release. It's Oak Ridge National Lab, and um, so they were. They have a 10 petabyte file system. It's 10.3 petabytes or something like that. And uh, they were, in their acceptance testing, they were getting 240 gigabytes a second um, for read and write. From, I, I think it, it, it didn't end up being that many clients. I think it was on the order of a few hundred clients um, generating that I.O. But that file system is connected to... 26,000 clients in total. So it's wow. pretty much the biggest in every dimension. Yeah. Pretty cool. So how does Luster handle like a, a file system failure? But before we do that, should probably is Luster just like a networking and server on top of 
a file system we're all familiar with, kind of like NFS, or does it actually have its own file system underneath? So one of our early design decisions with Lustre is that we weren't going to develop our own on-disk file system. I mean, that getting a, a disk file system to work reliably, you know, takes five years or more. And, um, you know, that just wasn't uh, an approach that, you know, we could we could handle given this, you know, three people in our company when it first started. Um, so we started with ext3 in order to um, use the journaling and atomic, you know, update uh, facilities in ext3. And over time, we, you know, modified ext3 um, with different features like uh, extents, um, a better uh, allocator, uh, more efficient uh, extended attributes and things like that. And so we, we've stuck, you know, largely to the, the ext3 code and a lot of that, that work has been pushed upstream into ext4 now. But, uh, you know, Lustre is generally like NFS in that regard that it, it re-exports uh, individual file systems and each of those file systems is actually just, you know, a completely coherent local file system that you can mount and, you know, dig into if you need to. And it's really the clients that, that do the work of aggregating, you know, the metadata server and, you know, files striped across multiple um, objects, storage servers that, you know, combine all of that into one file system that, you know, the user and applications can see. And um, in terms of how Lustre handles failure, uh, fortunately, because each of these file systems is completely independent, and um, you know they're local disk-based file systems that are you know pretty robust themselves, it's possible to run you know E2FS check on each of those file systems in parallel, um, you know, or if there's there's problems that occur during runtime. Uh, Luster can can run with um, failed storage servers. Uh, if the metadata server is down, you know your file system isn't visible, so it's not really possible to run in that mode. But uh, for failed OSTs, it's possible to continue using the file system. So let me ask you a question uh, from from my own bias. I'm I'm uh, you know an MPI guy here and. Um, all the, all the MPIs out there have various levels of support for different parallel file systems and whatnot. I wonder if you could just give a little bit of explanation of, you know, what exactly does it mean for an MPI to tie into a parallel file system? Because with MPI2, they introduced, you know, the concept of uh, parallel reading and writing and whatnot. Maybe you could describe a little bit about, uh, you know, what Lustre does to support uh, the various MPIs out there and how to extract uh, good performance. And, you know, what, what metrics are you trying to optimize on for MPI kinds of workloads, given that there's, you know, oodles of different kinds of MPI workloads, but at least there's some commonality in saying an MPI workload versus other kinds of uh, parallel workloads. Yeah, so um, there's really, in, in the HPC world, there's generally, you know, two kinds of I.O. workloads. One is called file per process, so if you have, you know, 100 nodes each, you know, running 100 tasks, you'd get 100 output files. And um, the second kind of, of I.O. workload is called shared single file. So even though you have 100 tasks running in your MPI job, they're each writing to some pre-allocated uh, part of a single file, usually the, the rank number times some offset. And so Lustre can handle both of those workloads fairly well. As you would imagine, running with file per process, you you get the best performance because there's there's no contention between each of those files. Um, Lustre handles all of the locking and everything separately for each file. Versus shared file I/O, you can um, you have to lock the the file and the data so that it's coherent between all of the clients and so that adds some overhead um, what's interesting in, in newer f 
in newer clusters as you scale up the number of cores, you know, into the hundreds of thousands um, on, you know, the biggest systems like Jaguar at Oak Ridge. They have, you know, 256,000 cores or something like that. It starts to get to the point where you don't want to create one file per process. They They have started shifting all their applications over to using a single shared file and um, you just don't want, you know, 250,000 output files for every, you know, one hour of computation or whatever it is you do. So they've started shifting the the I/O over to shared file, but they they limit the number of, of nodes that are sub submitting the I/O to avoid as much lock contention as they can. And um, how that ties into MPI is that. Um, Luster has uh, an MPI I.O. driver um, for the ADIO interface in MPitch. I believe MPitch 2, it was submitted upstream. And so it can you know, efficiently um, you know, set the striping and you know, the number of, of OSTs that are involved for writing a single file um, based on hints and the rank count and things like that. Um, supplied by the MPI application, and while it's you know it's possible to do all of this from you know calling an IOCTL or a, uh, an API in Luster directly from your application, um, doing it inside the MPI IO layer is you know a lot easier for for most application writers. Question for you: You, you um, one one clarification question on your answer there. You said that uh, down at Jaguar, uh, one of the things that they do is they limit the number of uh, MPI processes that are outputting to the shared file. I'm just curious: Does the MPI library hide that from the application? So, you know, from the application's perspective, are they all writing, but MPI is doing some coalescing down to a smaller number of nodes underneath before doing? The file rights, or is that something they actually adapted their applications to do? Um, I think it's a, it's a bit of both. Um, there's there's a facility in the MPI I/O layer called Collective I/O, and um, for smaller I/O submissions, uh, I, I believe this is a mode that you have to activate, but I'm not totally sure. But Collective I/O will aggregate. Um, you know, small writes from many clients onto, um, you know, the I.O. nodes, essentially, and merge them, you know, based on file offset and then submit large I.O. requests to Luster. And so that's that's done inside the uh, Luster MPI driver. But I think once you get beyond a certain threshold, um, the amount of communication that you need at the network level to aggregate the I.O., uh, is is not efficient, and so we don't do that ourselves. Uh, it's up to the application to decide, you know, which nodes need to to do the aggregate. But that's not my area of expertise. So you mentioned a stripe. Um, actually, when administering a Luster system, it seems like I'm worrying about stripes a lot. Could you mention um, expand on what a stripe is? So in Luster, um, because there's separate servers that are, that are providing the storage for individual files, um, one of the, de the, the decisions that's made when a file is first allocated is how many servers will this file reside on. And so that's, that's a fairly you know, static decision today in that when you first create the file, you you know, if you don't specify anything, it, it picks a, you know, a global file system default number of stripes. Or if you, you've set striping um, on a directory, it will determine how many OSTs this file is spread over. And uh, the number of stripes that you use for your files really depends quite a bit on how your, your application is running. So as you can imagine, um, if, if your file is striped over a lot of OSTs, um, you, can, you can get quite high bandwidth, but it's not always the best decision. Um, you know, if you have a thousand clients, uh, 
and they're each you know writing individual files then spreading those files over you know all of your OSTs just increases contention because now each OST has to handle you know a small chunk from each of these thousand clients and you'd be far better off only having one stripe so that a client is only writing to one OST you know it keeps the the RPCs um, smaller. It, it reduces the amount of of locking that's needed to be handled for each um, for each file, and so it's it's not always a totally obvious decision with Lustre on how many files or how many objects a file should be striped over. Um, work that we're that we're doing now um, for the HSM project is actually going to also allow us to. You know, potentially restripe files after they've been created, but it's not something that's supported today. Now, what about in a case like the cluster I operate? We don't run large, few, very wide jobs. We run many medium to small sized jobs. So we probably have, oh, a thousand running jobs, and we only have. 32 OSTs and our default stripe size is 1. Does that actually help out because you mentioned the client speak directly with the OS um the OSS so are all the IOs coming from these different independent jobs doing their different thing kind of being isolated from each other because they're going to be load balanced across all the different OSTs? Yeah, I mean to a certain extent um they are they are load balanced. Um, the The selection of which OSTs a file is is placed on is generally done um, by the the MDS. Um, you know, unless you you override it specifically, but um, the the MDS does some job to to do uh, load balancing based on how responsive the uh, OSTs are. Um, it OSTs are also have space imbalances, um, you know, beyond uh, I think it's like ten percent. If the amount of free space between the OSTs is imbalanced, it will also, um, you know, preferentially place new files on the less full OSTs. And so, if you have lots of independent jobs, like you say, um, you know, it, it, it tries to, sp to spread the work as evenly as possible over all of the OSTs. Let me ask you a question in a different direction here now. Um, I'm an open source developer myself, and so it's always interesting to me to hear how other open source projects are developed. Um, so what what is your model? I mean, I, I kind of assume – you have to forgive me. I don't know at all, but I kind of assume that most of the development happens there at Sun, and uh, the open source aspect is mainly for some collaboration with some of the larger labs, but you're not really actively seeking a development community – too large outside of Sun? That's a pure guess on my part. I wonder, could you just describe, you know, what is your development model and how do you interact with the open source world and things like that? Yeah, so um, Luster is uh, is GPL and um, it, uh, you know, is it's you're right in that, you know, the primary development does happen inside Sun. Um, we have had some larger contributions from um, outside parties, in particular uh, CEA, which is the uh, French Atomic Energy Commission. Um, they're working, they've finished one um, project called OST Pools, and they're working on a second one, which is HSM Hierarchical Storage Management for Lustre. Um, other, you know, groups, Lawrence Livermore in particular, have submitted, you know, smaller um, patches and things like that. But, um, you know, Contrary to your comment that we're not really seeking a developer community, I think the unfortunate thing is that Luster is complicated enough that it's sort of self-selecting, right? Um, you know, while we'd be happy to get lots and lots of patches from the outside world, the truth is is that it's just complicated and people generally don't, um, you know, dig in and, and fix the problems, right? And so in terms of you know, how does our company, um, you know, even before we were acquired by Sun, uh, 
but uh, you know we provide um, you know contract support and um, for a long time also um, we also get uh, development contracts from our, our larger customers you know to implement features that they're specifically interested in but I think it's it's just you know so complicated that that not many people can understand it and sometimes we have trouble ourselves <laughs> I, I can completely understand. I mean, OpenMPI, I think we're probably not as complex as, as Lustre, but uh, you, you're right that there's a, a small number of people out there who are willing to dig into the code and say, aha, here is the exact place where you're having the problem or feature uh, for, for something. It's just it's just big and complicated. It's the way it goes. Uh, let me ask you a mundane question uh, simply because this is just I, I ask this to everybody. What uh, version control system do you use? Uh, currently, we use CVS um, with a lot of scripts around it to manage branches wow. more efficiently. I but, think you're the first uh, one to CVS. <laughs> yeah, so we've wanted to move off of CVS for probably a few years now. Um, and we actually have a project that has somebody working on it full time to move us over to Git. Um, so, yeah, we, we've, we've known about the limitations of CVS for quite a while, but uh, it's it's just sheer inertia that's kept us there until, you know, we move over to Git. And hopefully that'll happen. Absolutely. I can understand that, yeah. Okay. So how about a little bit of what's slated for the future of Lustre? There's been a lot of changes going on. Um, what should we expect to see in the next couple of releases? So the, the, the main development focus right now is on the uh, the 2.0 release of Lustre. I mean, mind you, development is maybe a wrong word. Um, the development is largely frozen, and they're mostly bug fixing on the 2.0 release of Lustre. And that one's primarily um, focused on a rewrite of the metadata server in order to make it... Um, more scalable and um, also to allow us to uh, have more flexibility for feature additions in the future. Um, there's a number of, of changes that will allow us to uh, add support for a feature called clustered metadata, which allows us to you know scale the number of MDTs in a single file system so that we can scale up metadata performance, um, you know, linearly by adding more metadata uh, targets into a single file system. Um, we also uh, will be able to take the, the, the metadata server and um, the object storage server and move them over to uh, ZFS-based file systems. And um, while none of that is actually in the 2.0 code yet, um, a large part of the code rewrite was was done to facilitate those kind of features coming in the future. So 2.0 itself has um, a limited number of immediate features. Um, one of them is is uh, change logs, which is essentially like a you know like an RSS feed for changes that are going on in the file system. And uh, so then you can hook in you know a backup tool or an rsync tool. Or um, you know, in the future for for HSM, um, it will be able to hook into this change log and uh, avoid scanning the file system to look for changes. And you know, if, if you're looking at the scales of file systems that we're working on, um, you know, one of our our targets, you know, from a customer, an actual whole series of customers for 2012 is a file system with a trillion files in it. And um, we're not going to be able to scan that every day for, you know, what file to back up, right? So um, that's change logs. Going a little farther out, the release beyond 2.0 is going to have um, the ZFS support and um, some previews of, of other features, uh, Kerberos um, authentication and encryption over the network, um, the cluster metadata preview, 
So these will not be production supported uh, features, but um, they'll be largely functional and available for people to start, you know, kicking the tires and things like that. So you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, Luster takes off where, you know, a single NFS or, or a big honking file server of, of some flavor uh, leaves off, right, where you want the really big file systems and you're going traditionally for the HPC kinds of space. Do you ever see Luster moving into other markets? Do you ever see it becoming a bit more commoditized um, for, um, I don't know, other kinds of data center applications that are not necessarily HPC, but also not necessarily ginormous? They're just, you know, big? Um, or, you know, do you, do you ever see it becoming more mainstream, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's um, you know, increasing focus on making Luster easier to use and configure. And I think that's a prerequisite for any kind of, you know, general, um, you know, adoption in a more mainstream environment. I mean, you know, the, the amusing thing is that, you know, in the past we have had rocket scientists, you know, managing the file system and... Um, so it's it's you know, if if you started off with Luster, you know, a few years ago, it's definitely gotten better since then. Um, you know, there there are some applications where, you know, Luster does well even, even when you don't, um, you know, have a gigantic file system. There was one um, partner that was doing, um, you know, chip layout. And uh, because Luster is, you know, fully cache coherent among the clients, um, they can run, you know, multi-threaded jobs that, you know, are are scaling and caching a lot of data themselves without um, having problems with NFS. And so there's a few applications like that that, you know, do benefit from having Luster at uh, a lower scale. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't really see it, well, I mean, at least for myself, I don't see it making sense once you get below, you know, four OSTs, let's say, because you can, you know, Luster is just exporting the local disk in some sense. And so things like NFS can do reasonably well, um, you know, doesn't make sense, um, to have a single server that runs everything, and it's actually a common question on, on the you know Luster mailing list, or has been in the past. You know, somebody has, you know, two SATA disks, and they say, "Oh, I want to aggregate that storage, and you know, do failover and things like that." But it's not really the target audience that we have. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is this has been a great time. Thank you so much for getting on the show. Um, you guys were the most requested thing out there, but um, if anyone listening to this wants to request another topic, um, there's a nomination form on our website at www.rce-cast.com, and there you can subscribe um, to the iTunes feed or the RSS feed to get these shows automatically, and we kick them out every two weeks. So thanks, thanks a lot again. Oh, my Appreciate pleasure. your time. No problem at all. Yeah, thanks. Mm-hmm.